I think we need a deeper questioning about what is going to underlie our economic system going forward if we want to solve this. It's not going to be little tweaks here and there and cap and trade. It's, it's going to really have to be a, a deeper questioning about the wisdom of um, the holy grail of economic growth. Uh, it's going to be a questioning about the wisdom of um, the commodification of labor, about the wisdom of continually extracting our natural resources until they're gone is uh, the way of being. So, you know, I don't know if we have, as humanity are up for asking ourselves those deep questions, but I think we're going to need to if, if we hope to continue to um, survive on a livable planet. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock under the organic seal. You just heard from Leah Penniman. She's the co-founder of Soul Fire Farm outside Albany. It's a community farm and an educational facility that is training the next generation of farmer activists. Leah is also the author of Farming While Black, Soul Fire Farm's practical guide to liberation on the land and she's the recipient of the 2019 James Beard Leadership Award. So let's listen to my co-director, Dave Chapman, as he interviews Leah Penniman. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. And I'm very happy to be talking with Leah Penniman today. Leah, welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks yeah. for being here at Soul Fire Farm. No, it's great, it's beautiful. I've never been before. Uh, how long have you been doing this? So let's see, we wed ourselves to this land back in 2006 and built our home and built up the soils back from degradation for four years. So the farm opened in 2010 and we've been living here full time and running the farm since then. Were you still teaching in that time? Yes, so I was a, um, I was a high school science teacher for 17 years and only left my position in the summer of 2019. And so the work as a farmer has been simultaneous to uh, the work as a high school teacher. Right. I, I think that's, it's very common for farms to have at least, you know, one member of the family working out so that the farm can exist. It's, it's more common than not in America. So, um, Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, my partner, Jonah, also ran a natural building and timber framing company for several years and was only able to leave that company when the farm was five years old or so. But I continued to work as a, a high school teacher, you know, for several more years after that. Now both of us are full time on the farm, but we've added a nonprofit component to the farm. So many of our staff are paid through the grants and donations that come in to support our educational programming. So even in this, in that sense, the farm continues to be supported through non-farm enterprises like education and agritourism and, you know, the community work that we do. Yeah. As I drove here with my wife, she was telling me, because she checked Soulfire out online, she was so impressed at what you're doing. Oh, thank you. And, um, I mean, any, any, farm and any startup farm, any small farm, any organic farm is kind of impressive, but uh, you've, you've gone beyond that uh, in a lot of ways. And um, it feels that there's something that is so hopeful about creating a model that's different. Could you talk about hope and <laughs> models? and how those go together and what, what's important Ooh, Hope about and models, yeah. I mean, when you say hope, the first thing I think about is the inspirational founding story of our farm, which of course is our ancestral grandmothers who braided seeds in their hair before being forced onto transatlantic slave ships. And they had hope in a time of immense tragedy and uncertainty, so much so that they stored seeds, believing in a future on soil. And we think about that literally in terms of passing down our ancestral seeds, but also metaphorically, what is it to take what's been given to us through the fortitude of our ancestors and keep it going? So, I mean, as far as how that, that shows up in the model, you know, Soul Fire Farm, where there's 10 of us, half of us live here, half of us don't, and, and we're dedicated to uprooting racism and seeding sovereignty in the food system. So we're you know, regenerating land, we're growing food, we're doing doorstep delivery, 
of, of food to folks who need it. We're training the next generation of farmers and doing a lot of advocacy for those farmers. And the model evolves. The model evolves in response to what our community is asking for and our community's input. So it's been, you know, it's really beyond my wildest imaginings that we would be here. We didn't set out thinking, oh, let's be part of a national conversation about rising generation black farmers or let's, uh, you know, have thousands of people coming through here to learn. You know, I thought, I thought we would be in the woods pretty alone. We'd maybe have a few tours or some youth groups coming out to learn about farming and, and grow food for people and was satisfied with that. But it, it was so clear really early on in the evolution of the farm that there is a community need for much more. You know, we had parents calling and saying, can you run programs for, for my children? You know, we had aspiring farmers saying, can I come and apprentice? And so it was clear there was a need for more. And, and so as far as model, I think the model is listening is really being accountable and responsive to what is the earth saying is needed and also what is the, the human community saying is needed for us to have a, a healthier future. So. Yeah. When the organic movement began in America, I, it, it's true in other parts of the world, but when it began in America, when it came and it, it was called organic, it was part of uh, a movement that was very much mission-based. And it was about creating an alternative, uh, a better way. It was part of a lot of change in America, a lot of change uh, politically, socially, racially, all this stuff was going on. And there was uh, a group of people in the country who started growing food. And, and people in the cities were like, we need different food, right? So there was a, it was going together. It feels that as things have evolved, as, as life has gone on, some of that mission has gotten lost um, in, in sense of as organic has grown. And people like me who started out young and wanting to make something different, after a little while, or we, we also got confronted with how do we make a living? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that, that has its own power to mold us and shape us. And I think sometimes something that somebody out in California said to me, a, a farmer, and he said, I, I envy you in New England because you still have idealism about organic. And out here, it's really just become a business. Hmm. And I, I don't e actually think that's true from the organic farmers I've talked to out in California. A lot of them still have a lot of idealism about what they do. But I think it's important to find a way to keep our idealism as we grow and expand and get beyond a small unit, which I think you're already doing. You're already beyond a small unit. You've got how many people are part of, Sol you know, the core part of Soul Fire Farm now? Well, I guess we're sort of a rings of concentric circles, right? And so we have a few thousand folks who come through physically the farm training programs every year, but then many more thousands who read our books and literature or take our online classes. Um, so I would say the Soul Fire Farm community is, is really large and growing and is also intersecting with a movement community. There are organizations like uh, the, you know, the Black, National Black Food and Justice Alliance, the Heal Food Alliance, the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, uh, Southeast African American Farmers Organic Network, right? These are our sibling organizations that we collaborate with and so Together, it creates a mycelial network that is sharing a lot of resources and um, inspiration and idealism, as you say, to try to chart this way forward. Yeah. My wife was asking, we were talking about what is it that sustains people who are working in movements that often face um, institutional, historical barriers that are massive. It's very hard to change change these large ships mm -hmm. going through the ocean. What is it that you feel sustains what you're doing here? Well, it's a good point about systemic barriers because they are many, and especially in our community of black and brown farmers. You know, we're in a situation where almost all of the arable land in the United States is owned by one racial group, which is white Americans. You know, 98% by value, 95% by acreage. Um, we're in a situation where the you know, U.S. Department of Agriculture, who's supposed to distribute resources to 
farmers without regard to identity is systematically discriminating against black and brown farmers and also against farmers who are doing small scale regenerative. I mean, the piece of the pie that small scale regenerative gets is really small compared to um, these large industrialized commodity farms. And, um, and, you know, and even the programs that exist are quite onerous in terms of the reporting requirements for a very small amount of, of resources. Um, we're facing lack of access to capital, to training. So there's so many institutional barriers. Um, but what gives me hope and sort of what sustains me is that if anything, the energy of the rising generation is increasing, you know? So I had bought into this myth that um, black and brown folks didn't want to farm. Black and brown folks uh, were not interested in the environment. Uh, uh, we're not interested in uh, sort of rural and agrarian lifestyles. And it couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, one thing, there's scientific data coming out, especially around the climate crisis, that communities of color are way more concerned, as it would make sense, right, about climate, about these environmental issues, than white communities or the population at large. These are the folks who are basements are flooded in the hurricane or lost their homes. These are folks who are actually fighting wild, wildfires or out there in the fields um, experiencing heat stroke while they harvest cabbage in these, you know, unprecedented heat waves. So, so that's supporting what I'm seeing anecdotally, which is that we have a multi-year waiting list for our farmer training programs. Um, my phone and emails, you know, off the hook all day long. Can you send this, that, the re third resource? How do I get a high tunnel? How do I um, get those seeds that I saw you had on Instagram? And so I think there's a huge amount of momentum and that folks are, are kind of undeterred in some ways by those barriers. Our community is really used to institutional barriers. Um, knows how to push against them, but also knows how to make our own institutions. So I'll say, for example, um, I mentioned that the U.S. Department of Agriculture has a, a real nast, nasty track record in terms of providing capital and, and loans to black farmers. So a bunch of black farmers in New York got together and they formed their own fund. It's the Black Farmer Fund of New York. It provides capital, non-extractive loans, grants um, by the people for the people. Just saying, you know what? Like, We'll keep pushing because the USDA needs to be accountable. But in the meantime, we know how to build our own institutions, our own, you know, food hubs and land trust and, and these institutions that really help support farmers in doing the type of uh, doing agriculture at all, but particularly doing regenerative agriculture. And I will say that, of, you know, of everyone that we've worked with and trained, you know, 100 percent of folks are interested in uh, a, a climate and biodiversity healthy way of farming. There's no one who's interested in an extractive model of farming. And so that's also really inspiring. Yeah, that's great. So what's the relationship between this group of, uh, this growing group of black farmers mm -hmm. and the organic movement? It, it sounds like what you're saying is that, let, let's not use the word certification for a minute and let's just talk about the organic movement that the the there's a complete alliance there is that is that fair it's to a say? good question i mean i think we have to talk about how to define the organic movement i mean i would say that it started in 1890 with dr george washington carver black farmer at tuskegee university in alabama who convinced a whole generation of growers coming through that institution to prioritize soil health above all else. And so he said, we need to be doing diversified horticulture. We need to rotate our crops, integrate a fallow, uh, silvopasture our animals and incorporate them into a rotational grazing system that composting and pulling out mulch materials from the forest and swamplands was necessary. And that uh, the most important thing was to build up soil life. So Dr. George Washington Carver in the late 1800s, two generations before Rodale, many generations before 1970s, you know, organic, was talking about this. And so the black community was uh, farming in this way through the late 1800s and early 1900s. And in, in many ways, it became the, um, the saving strategy because soils were getting so depleted with the monocropping of cotton and tobacco at the time that a lot of soils were just getting abandoned, but farmers were able to hold on. Um, I think building on that, uh, the economic model that came out of that, also out of Tuskegee University, was uh, Dr. Dr. Booker T. Watley, who came up with the concept of farm to table in the mid-1900s. He was saying, you know, growing for these um, purveyors of commodity crops 
is, is not the winning economic strategy. We need this direct consumer relationship. So we're gonna grow a whole lot of things, get people to be members of our farm, um, give them wholesale prices for a share of the harvest, and they'll also be welcome to come pick their own, right? So this is, this is the, the organic movement that we're part of, right? I don't know, I cannot evaluate to what extent, honestly, the white organic movement that came later is in conversation you know, with the regenerative movement that started in the 1800s out of Tuskegee University. I think that there's some overlap. There's organizations like NISOG um, that have made some diversity efforts. And so there's some shared conversations. Um, but I think in some ways they're running parallel. And I would not say that, that we've done the work to, to really find like where the alignment and the alliance is in, in those spaces. Right, right. Let me ask you, do you believe that um, the movement for racial justice and the movement for social justice and the, the movement for um, real access to good food, that these are all the same thing as the movement for climate justice, that they're not different, that they're literally the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think regenerative ag, climate justice, and racial justice are all intimately connected um, for a few reasons. One is that the, the solutions to our ecological crises, by and large, if not almost all, come from indigenous communities around the world. Everything we know from how to draw down carbon in a perennial polyculture um, to how to steward wetlands over the long term so they maintain uh, their carbon sequestration potential to biodiversity maintenance being compatible with human habitat. We get these from indigenous African, indigenous Asian, indigenous American communities. Um, so the solutions come from these communities. That's the first. I think it's also uh, really integral in the sense of, of who's most impacted, who's on the front lines. And I already touched on this a little bit, but you know, 85% of the people doing farm labor in this country are uh, Latine and Hispanic people, people of color, um, many of whom are indigenous, but are the ones on the front lines of those heat waves, you know, the front lines of the pest outbreaks and, and the increasing use of pesticides to deal with these climate induced uh, malfunctions in, in, um, in ecosystems who are fighting the wildfires that come about because of these drought conditions and mismanagement of the forest. It's, you know, black and brown folks on the front lines of, of the hurricanes and tropical storms and extreme weather events. Um, and as a result, you know, it's, it's now statistically documented, but you know, also you can intuit that these commu our communities have more interest and more passion also in the issue. And so we're just, you, you mentioned that we're up against a really, a behemoth, this really big system and we're gonna to need to work together. And so there's no way of, of winning the fight with you know, just one racial group or one little enclave sort of waving their flag. We need everybody in it together. And of course, the people who are most concerned about the issue, it makes sense to have them in leadership. So um, yeah, I see it all intimately connected. I don't believe that there can be any movement, ecological movement or climate movement that doesn't center the needs of those who are most impacted. Otherwise it's a fad or a trend. It's not really a movement um, and it's not gonna be effective. So yeah, it is, it is, um, Racial justice is not a side issue or a footnote. It's really central in my mind to all of this. I, I was listening to a, uh, an interview this morning and they talked about the kind of the formation of the environmental movement in, I think it was in the 70s. And they were saying that a decision was consciously made by a number of groups not to take on social issues. Right. Oh, I Not feel like I colors. listened to some podcast about that. Yeah. It was really good. Yeah. And it was also about the invention of greenwashing. Mm. And, um, you know, that, that it was actually one person who's sort of a genius of, of evil. And, and, you know, he realized that the old strategy of trying to defame people like um, um, Rachel Carson wasn't successful, or, or Ralph Nader, that the successful strategy was to blend with them mm -hmm. and to say, yes, that's right. Yep. <laughs> We're going to do that. And here we've developed a program, you know, to create a green planet and without changing any realities. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. What do you think of all that? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I want to question the idea that the environmental movement was birthed in the 1970s. 
Of course. You know, I think maybe a particular branch of the environmental movement, but environmentalism and commitment to the environment goes back millennia and is an indigenous strategy, right? And so for one community to sort of catch up to that doesn't mean that that's the inception, but um, absolutely. I've seen uh, firsthand the corporate greenwashing attempts of nodding and saying yes. I mean, I think most notably right now with the carbon credit schemes, where corporations are, are buying their right to continue to pollute by supposedly protecting or enhancing forests. But you know, when third party investigators have looked, it's really dubious the claims about how effective that is. And you see atmospheric CO2 continue to rise even in the face of these carbon uh, purchasing schemes. And so I think, I think we have to look really critically at um, anything that capitalism purports to put forth as a solution because fundamentally capitalism is based on an extractive mentality that is about human beings right to pillage and plunder and extract resources from the earth and extract labor from people of color and I think we need a deeper questioning about what is going to underlie our economic system going forward if we want to solve this it's not going to be little tweaks here and there and cap and trade, it's, it's going to really have to be a, a deeper questioning about the wisdom of um, the holy grail of economic growth. Uh, it's going to be a questioning about the wisdom of um, the commodification of labor, about the wisdom of continually extracting our natural resources until they're gone is uh, the way of being. So, you know, I don't know if we have, as humanity are up for asking ourselves those deep questions, but I think we're going to need to if, if we hope to continue to um, survive on a livable planet. So it's, it's some pretty serious times. You know, I was just interviewed Stephen Kerwood of uh, Living on Earth for my next book, Black Earth Wisdom. And he was saying that 30 years ago when he was trying to get his show going, you know, NPR and other outlets were turning him down saying there's no story here. You know, climate change at that time was not a word that 85% uh, of the American public did not understand that word or had not heard of this. And they're like, you'll run out of stories in six weeks. You know, there's no show here. And, uh, you know, he's a black man who had the foresight. He says the way they're talking about the climate is the way they seem to be talking about black people, they're just disregarding the issue. Um, and he didn't want to stand for that disregard and so push forward. And, you know, we're still hearing living on earth and we're still hearing. And now we, and now I think it's, we're quite aware that these issues of climate and the environment are really central to the survival of our species. Um, but we need to be listening, right, to impacted communities about that. That's right, that's right. It's an, it's an interesting question for me sometimes about if we learn, if we become informed, if we're talking, are we creating change? <laughs> Not necessarily. Not the necessarily. talk is often the precursor to action, right? Yeah. You. Um, you know, you hear, you reflect, you understand, you move, but not always, you know, talking is not a substitute for action. Yeah. yeah. You, so let's talk about change for a minute. You talked about, it's not enough to take organic muffins to your neighbor, <laughs> right? And, and that we, we really need change on a different level, that, that it's wonderful. To be kind to your neighbor, it's wonderful that the muffins are organic. But what is the thing that we need that goes beyond that? It's a good question. I mean, I think what, what you're getting at there is the difference between like individual choice and societal transformation. And it's not just the sum of individual actions that make societal transformation. We're in a society that has institutions and laws and budgets. And so changing those rules of play um, are really important. So I'll give an example, right? Like if we use the, the muffin way of being to try to end slavery, where one at a time, each abolitionist neighbor reached out to each slaveholding neighbor and tried to convince them via organic muffins, right? That like, we really should maybe not hold uh, human beings as chattel and maybe convinced a few people to free the enslaved Africa, but some still did it. And, you know, we'd be in a really different world. Uh, what actually needed to happen was that legislation needed to be passed to say, this is unacceptable. This is no longer part of our social contract as America. It's unacceptable. And even if you feel like, you know, as the so-called master, um, self-proclaimed master, that you should have the right to do this, we are telling you that you do not um, and that there are actually consequences for that that will be enforced and I think um, 
getting the political will to make that policy change did involve a lot of individual conversations and kindness to your neighbor and convincing people because you have to get to a tipping point. But we mark the success of the tipping point by a change in institutions and laws. And so I think we need, um, as an example, farm workers in this country do not have the right to overtime pay, a day off in seven, the right to collectively bargain, um, and still are subjected to wage theft and abuses that there is not an enforcement agency to protect. I don't want to go around and convince the doles of the world that they need to be nicer. I would like our government to pass laws that give farm workers, farm workers equal rights and have an enforcement agency that sees that those rights are carried out. So that's what I'm talking about. It's like muffins might be a step, you know, but ultimately we need to change our institutions. That's well said. Um, do you have you have you heard about the Denone dump of New England dairy farmers? Do you know about that? No. Yeah. You want to fill me in? Yeah, they're they're Denone through Horizon. Uh -huh. Denone owns Horizon. Horizon is is dropping eighty nine dairy farms in a year in oh my. all the farms they have in Vermont, all the farms they have in New Hampshire, all the farms in Maine, and 47 farms in New York. And, um, you know, they gave them a year's notice and then they're dropping their contracts. That will effective, effectively put them out of business. Yeah, that's destroying, it's further destroying dairy. Yeah. It was the, um, so I'm not as familiar with that and I did not even know that Danone owned Horizon, which is interesting because Danone has reached out to try to support Soul Fire Farm. So, there'll be some conversations to be had there. Um, but, you know, what I'm more familiar with is, you know, probably a couple decades back now, the, a big hit to the dairy industry, well, one was removing the price supports, but then uh, rural legislators out here became convinced that developing the prison system was the solution to rural poverty. So contracted public and private prisons all throughout dairy country in upstate New York Dairy farmers were going out of business because of price supports and got jobs in the prisons. Now, of course, for prisons to run, they need to be filled. And so these rural legislators started to push for, you know, more of the three strikes you're out type policies, these sort of draconian drug laws and, you know, to make sure those prisons got filled and that their constituency would have these jobs. So there's something like seven counties in New York City that uh, supply 90 percent of the upstate New York prison population. But that's become the... Um, you know, there's an organization called Milk Not Jails that came out of this trend of jails replacing dairy. So, yeah, no, no good. No good. No good at all. No good. And yeah, it's, I, I, we've really, you know, there've been a lot of conversations about how to save these farms and actually nobody's come up with any great ideas yet. And that's a perfect example of so Vermont is a good example of a place that has a lot of organic farms and a lot of awareness of that in the people who go to the store and buy food or go to the CSA or go to the farm stand. And yet for the dairy farmers of whom, I don't know, there might be a couple who are selling direct and bottling, but most of them sell into the co-ops and sell into Horizon. Of course. Horizon is 10% of the dairy farms in Vermont, 20% in Maine. And and it shows, it reminds us that we are part of a food system that is international. And what happens in California or Brazil does affect New York or Vermont. And um, we need to understand that and act accordingly. So it is important what's happening in other places to all of us. Is there any kind of campaign going on to convince Horizon not to drop these farmers or... Is that, what is the response? There's been a, there's a petition and, um, you know, it got, I don't know, 13,000 signatures asking them to at least delay dropping longer to help the farms find alternatives. Um, there's a question of whether to do a boycott. And mm -hmm. I think uh, some have been persuaded by others to wait a little and see what comes of the petition. And there's been a lot of reaching out and publicizing and trying to let people know what's happening. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's, these are such powerful forces, Danone, which it doesn't surprise me that they reached out to support Soulfire. They're a B Corp. 
and that's part mm -hmm. of their mission. And they do act on that, and yet at the same time, but they undermine it at the same time, the which same time. reminds me of the greenwashing conversation. So maybe you throw a few thousand dollars here and there at some nonprofits and do some podcasts, right? But if fundamentally your business practices are undermining the very food system that you purport to support, you know, those efforts are canceled. Yeah. They cancel out. Yeah. Yeah, that's devastating. I mean, these farms are probably barely holding on as it is. Barely I know we were, on. there was a campaign not long ago with um, Migrant Justice to bring some money to the farm so that they could provide better housing for their farm workers. Um, ben and Jerry's essentially agreed to pay a little bit more to the farms in their network so that the farm workers could have a day off, so that they could have housing with heat, right? Um, and I imagine it's not that the farmers don't want to provide these things, but they're probably working on really slim margins, which is why the campaign looked to the retailer to pay a premium that in turn is designated for these, um, you know, basic human rights supports, really. That's right. So. It's, a, it's a very smart way of, mm -hmm. of creating change in that system, mm -hmm. the same as the Immokalee workers. You know, yeah, going for Taco Bell and Wendy's and stuff and, and getting Walmart. them to pay. Yeah, mm -hmm. let's mm -hmm. let's talk to the big guns. Right, where the money actually is. <laughs> who are actually, uh, they have the money. They also have a lot to lose in a social media campaign that goes against them. So they did, they did act. They did improve. They did give that extra penny, which was enough mm -hmm. to make a huge change in a lot of people's mm -hmm. lives. But it's not a fundamental change in the system, right? It's it's sort of relying on um, this corporate dance of of public image, and you know, and and ultimately, I would like to see our laws and institutions change to say, of course, the workers are going to get a fair wage. You know, that's not up to the individual players. That's just how America does business. <laughs> that's what I'd like to see. You know, of course, farmers' milk will be purchased because there's price supports, and you know. But, yeah, we're a ways out. We have a ways to go. Mm -hmm. As David Bronner said, the work is generational. So we shouldn't <laughs> get discouraged just because there's a few bumps. Exactly. Yeah. Um, with this conversation in mind, is there anything you'd like to say about what you hope are next steps? Maybe next steps for the organic movement. Maybe next steps for what you're doing. Next steps for the organic movement. I mean, I think that um, I would really like to see the organic movement support the indigenous land back movement, because I think that we'll solve a lot by getting more land under indigenous control um, in this country. We'll solve a lot socially, we'll solve a lot ecologically, and we'll be able to build coalitions across communities that have historically ignored each other. So looking at land back, looking at reparations, looking at the the generational cries of people who've been dispossessed of land who want to be back in stewardship and relationship, I think will benefit um, all of us and the earth. So that's something I'm hoping for. And even though it's hard, I'm not going to give up hope. You know, humanity has been through lots of cycles of challenge um, and have found our way forward. And I think that, you know, this is a time, a pretty grave time in terms of how far we've gone down the road of, of ecological destruction. But it's also a hopeful time in that this generation that's coming up is really taking a stand and saying like, no more, you know, no more. So I'm hopeful and keep working. <laughs> All right, yeah. Leah Penniman, thank you very much for taking the time today. I appreciate it. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you will subscribe, tell your friends and leave us a rating and review. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to our conversation, is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 55. Please join us next time when our guest is climate activist Paul Hawken. He's the author of Drawdown and the newly released sequel, Regeneration. To find a real organic farm near you, visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farms. See you next time. <laughs>